Have you thought of breaking through? Ain't it part of what you do? Catch a victim while he's dumb. Break his larynx with your well, thumb. Time, time, and it's time to get high. Well, this ain't no goddamn dream. It's exactly what it seems. Wake up today just to lay back down and say I won't be coming back let's call it a heart attack give me some of that knack this is just a final payback they all flipped on me took my passions left me be when I had a place to sit a goddamn attitude to fit talk real smooth Things have changed and I have quit Got nothing to look forward to But a backlash full of lies And welcome back Welcome back. Here we are again, boys and girls. Thank you for pressing play. We have so much ground to cover. And of course, we have a favorite right now, Mr. Marshall Masters. Let's bring him right on in. How are you, my friend? Hey, I'm good, Michael. Good to be back. Very nice. Thanks for stopping in. Today, we have so much to talk about. As usual, we have articles to discuss, Signs 80, and of course, Revelation and Planet X. All my favorite things. All right. You know, it's favorite. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I've been doing it for 20 years. <laughs> I've never been my favorite. I would like to talk about growing roses with horsemen. It's just, it's so fascinating to me. It's the <laughs> end of the it world. I'm I mean, sorry. It's, I'm, being, <laughs> I'm being quarrelsome, but oh my gosh. It just like, I don't know why it just hit me that way, but it's <laughs> like, when you've been looking at this ugly oh, freaking yeah. rock for 20 years. For so long, Marshall. It's like, ugh. Oh, it is. Oh, and it's coming. And it's coming and we're tracking And everyone it. Uh, is denying it still. People are denying You know, everyone always the question. Number one question I get from people. Oh, when yeah. am I going to see? Of course, they never say I. They always say, when are we going to see it? Right. Because that translates in, into when am I going to be standing out on the street with all my skeptical neighbors and we're all pointing up at the sky and crapping our collective pants. Right. That's what they want to know. Is it real? Right. Is this really going to happen? Is this all made up? And I wish I could say it was entirely made up and a figment of our imagination. However, nothing is more frightening than reality, Marshall. Yeah, that's the truth. That is the truth. And uh, it's, you know, I first saw, the very first time I saw with my own eyes, live observation, via a, a beautiful webcam at a Turrialba volcano in Costa Rica was on Christmas Day, December 2012. I have been seeing this ugly frickin' rock ever since. <laughs> That's hilarious. And, um, and people keep asking, when are we? You know, and it's like, we has been seeing it since 2012. Uh, you know, welcome late to the party. I hope you're going to pick up the check. The uh, it just goes on this way, but we're tracking it in um, our signs articles, and <clears throat> our work just kind of spawns. You know, you start going in a direction, and it branches or builds or takes you to another level. And with signs, we've been doing about five years, and we've been tracking fireballs and earthquakes. And uh, the uh, we haven't tracked uh, volcanoes, but I can easily say that when I first started doing this in 1999, at that time, there was an average of about 40 eruptions a year, all right? 40 volcanic eruptions a year. Now we're averaging 40 a month. And... That is a huge uptick. And there's the same parallels with everything else we look at. And so when we look at uh, fireballs, now we don't, what we're doing is just so, you know, folks understand the terminology. Right. 
We use a lot of it. And you hear meteor, meteorites and all of this stuff. So here's the general definitions. A meteor is like a shooting star. You know, it's something coming into the atmosphere. If it makes it through the atmosphere and all the way to the ground, the meteor becomes a meteorite. All right. And a meteorite can be a big thing. Like, for example, the biggest in recorded history in modern times was Tunguska in uh, Siberia in the last right. century. And that was, um, boy, that thing flattened. I mean, they were reading newspapers by the light in Europe from that impact. It was that big. So a meteorite could be a little meteorite shower. It could be just being pummeled by a bunch of little rocks. Uh, or it's, uh, you know, a big hummer. All right. Now, when we have the meteors coming through the skies, we have the little ones, we call them shooting stars, typically. And I'm like anyone else. It's just, God, it's fun to sit out and watch, you know, shooting stars. Oh, yeah. Especially out in the, out where there are no lights. It's just pure darkness. That's when you could really see them. Yeah. And it's just magnificent. Right. So meteorite shower. You know, you go out and you're looking at the torrids or whatever, and oohs and ahs, and, I, you know, it's a lot of fun. We don't track any of that. That stuff's too small for us. We want the big honking smokers, all right? And that is fireballs. It's why they're called fireballs, because they, you know, they're ablating and burning like crazy and leaving a trail of smoke behind them. That's the reason why we call them smokers. Now... Uh, a fireball is doing that. Then a fireball becomes what we call a bolide when you have a detonation. It explodes because the smaller fireballs will just keep going and then they they disintegrate, break up into little pieces. <clears throat> and But when you have a bolide, you got uh, something of a sufficient mass that it's going to ablate, and then it's going to detonate. Ooh. And if it's if you have a light flash, that's a bull light. If you have a light flash along with uh, a pressure wave and a heat wave, now it's a super bull light. And an example of a super bull light is the Chelyabinsk in 2013. All right. So those are the definitions that you're looking for. We are just, I don't care how big or small, we want the smokers. And also there's another thing about them is what is their angle of attack? There's what we call them skimmers and plungers. And the uh, skimmers are the ones that typically will have multi-state, multi-jurisdiction reporting of observations because they're flatter trajectories and they just streak across state lines. Then you'll have them where they're big and they come plunging straight down. Uh, such was the case, for example, of Chelyabinsk. And when those happen, they're reported not across multiple jurisdictions, but they'll be like in one region or a city or state or something like that. But you'll have a huge number of reports. So it's big and, and plunging or it's big and it's skimming. And these are the things that we're looking at. Um, and we track all three because they have different meanings. The deep plungers were really helpful for us in determining the the shape and dimensions of the nemesis cloud that is surrounding the nemesis dark star, the brown dwarf star that is at the heart of what we generically call the Planet X system. Uh, technically, it should be the Nemesis constellation is a more precise term for it. And But we use Planet X because everyone's used to that. Right. So it works. Yeah, yeah it's fine. Um, yeah, as long as, you, you know, as long as we're on the same page, you can right. have different corners. And <clears throat> the, the thing here is we have been tracking year over year a steady increase. All right. This year, the pattern has changed, and it seems that we are in the, the, it's just the, the nemesis cloud has bands and it has gaps. 
and it looks very much like the rings of Saturn, uh, the way it shapes out. And so, you know, you have the thick ones and you have the thin ones, right? Um, but what we're seeing now is I am starting to see this year, and I just reported in Signs 80 up on my site, YOWUSA.com, is I am beginning to wonder openly about the acceleration to perihelion. And what's happening right now is, as I note in the article, we've been tracking observation videos. And the place actually that's the most fruitful for me is TikTok. And uh, if they're on, they used to always be on two, YouTube, but YouTube is such an ugly censor site. Oh, yeah. That they just, you know, scared a lot of people from doing anything. You know, you want to do cat videos? That's it. YouTube's your place, right? And if it's not a cat video, don't do it. And uh, especially if you're reporting a, uh, are the second sun that is a companion to Sol, which is a brown dwarf, a few times the size of, uh, you know, Jupiter. And that, you know, yeah, that's a no-no. You don't do that. Uh, you sure don't tell anybody that there's sentient life anywhere else in the solar system as well. Oh, that's a mistake, yeah. And, you know, those are just certain things you don't do. But we're tracking it and... We're the interesting thing about these TikTok videos is that I think what we're seeing is changing in nature because Nemesis is in a very peculiar orbit. It is in a comet like orbit, very fast, much faster than planets. Um, it is, it spends most of its time, it's steeply inclined to the ecliptic. It's slanted downwards. It spends most of its time in the southern skies and doesn't bother us. It's when it pops up a little bit into the northern skies and comes down that it creates real grief and havoc for us, which is what's happening now. And it's at that point in the orbit where it's moving towards uh, its point of perihelion. Now, Perihelion is where it's closest to the sun. Right, yeah, to the sun. But in the case of Planet X or Nemesis, what will happen is when it reaches perihelion, which is what we're estimating it's probably going to be next year, somewhere mid uh, the, the second half, sometime in the second half of next year. We've seen some fireworks, and in other words. The uh, in a book that I wrote back in 2013, we predicted it would be uh, we will see it when it reaches perihelion. We're seeing it now, people are seeing it all the time, but you can only see it limited periods right, early in the I... morning or in the evening because that's mm -hmm. the object is close to the sun and the glare prevents it from being seen at any other time. However, once it reaches perihelion, it will have moved away enough from the sun that it can become a daily fixture in the sky. And, uh, you know, at that point, people are going to look at it and, uh, you know, we can expect the reporting to be, don't worry, it's not going to hit us, which it won't hit us. But what they're not going to talk about is all the other grief that it's going to cause us. Absolutely. So we're in a shift in that. If you want to read the article and follow the signs theory, what's the big bada bing? Because the first thing that we're going to experience is Revelation 8-7, when this really starts to pop. Okay. And that is when, you know, it's the, you know, and, and this is the one I have on my site. Um, that revelation it. So let me just read it for you. Uh, I use Young's literal 1898. I believe that's the best for, for research. It's the best for readability. I think other editions are really elegant. They're really nice for people who just want to have a good read. But if you're researching, then Young's literal is what you use. And so Young's literal is... 8, 7, and the first messenger did sound, and there came hail and fire mingled with blood, and it was cast to the land, and the third of the trees was burnt up, and the green grass was burnt up, all right? Um, and it's an interesting metaphor because cast to the land 
I'm going to be doing after I do, I'm working on my next one. This is a small series of articles, which will be eight, eight and eight, nine. And what I find interesting is how the Bible repeats certain metaphors. And the word cast is a metaphor, which I think is, I'll talk about that a lot more in my next article, but let's just stick with hail and fire mingled with blood. And this is, we're talking about meteorite showers, impactors probably about the size of a boar's head, a pig's head, something like that. And uh, and they're traveling. And, fire. and these it's things are traveling fast, fire. by the way. Pardon? I said these things are traveling fast to the earth, by the way, in terms of all the, the fireballs and what you're talking about. You know, these things are traveling like 36,000 miles per hour, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're screaming in. Yeah. They're holding And ass. so for those of you that go and you read my article, uh, and you definitely want to, people are really liking it. It's Revelation 8, 7 and Planet X, the blood. And the blood is the metaphor that unlocks uh, a connection, not only between the Old Testament and the New Testament, but with the Colburn Bible as well. You find the exact, what I show in the article is the exact same metaphor used exactly the same way in three different texts written at the exact same time by people who observed the last flyby of Planet X, which was Exodus. Right. And Marshall, yourself and JP Jones uh, did the research. And before we begin talking about that, who exactly is JP Jones for those who don't know? Well, JP Jones likes to be anonymous. Ah, okay. He doesn't want to, you know, what I can tell you is JP has been with me for since the beginning, darn near. And a lot of people are, I have a lot of folks that help me out and send stuff to me and it really enables it. But JP is uh, a technologist. It, we're both systems analysts retired and as we did the same kind of work in the computer business now he did his uh over in the east uh a lot of government work things like that pretty high-end systems uh i was in the silicon valley and my clients were all the big names you know the uh that you're gonna have the lockheed martin the at&t oracle sun hp yeah i was uh jpl and uh, so we just work together. It, it, it's really fun when you get two system analysts together. And because uh, the, the, you know, it's, you don't have to explain the thinking process. Sure. You know, you're just playing off of each other and it really is cool. Yeah, so, two tech nerds together. I mean, can't get any better. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, JP is, he has been doing the database on the sign series. And he's been doing that for five years, um, steady. And I write the articles and he maintains the database, which is considerable at this point. And we're able to find interesting things. For example, one of the things we were reporting in our signs article for a long time was uh, that there was data capping of the earthquake data. Yeah. And this started a couple of years ago. And it was capped. It wouldn't go in excess of 10,000. No matter what was happening, it was wouldn't go in excess of 10,000. So it'd be like 950 to, you know, 950 to, you know, and, or 9,500 to 10,000, you know, kind of back and forth, back and forth. But you could see they were capping. We complained about it and complained about it and complained about it. And then finally it dawned on me in one article, I did this about five months ago. And I just said, you know what? <clears throat> I am reminded of an unusual pattern we began seeing in 2018 and 2019, where we would have earthquakes occurring in places where they don't usually occur or very infrequently occur. And these quakes were always within a range 3.1, 3.2, 3.3. It was always that. 3 1 to 3 2, 3 3. And it would always be followed by a, a, a whole lot of ones and twos aftershocks. And it, when we studied 
the signatures of the seismic readings, uh, we noticed something very unusual. These 313233s, when you have an earthquake and you look at that, with the signature, it starts with the energy release. So it starts building up kind of like a little nipple. It almost looks like a Hershey's kiss leaning on its left side, you know, pointing to the left. It looks like a Hershey kiss looking <laughs> yeah. to the left. And that's the energy release. And then when the movement occurs, that's when the needle goes, the big scratcheroo, right? Zoom, zoom. All right. Well, what's happening is there's no, we're looking at these three, one, three, two, three, three, no Hershey kiss, no energy release, just suddenly, boom. Hmm. Well, that's synthetic, my friend. And only one thing causes that a very large explosion, like a small tactical nuke that would be used to destroy a vast underground dumb i had a feeling you're going to say that yeah base. and so what i said in my article is that now i figured out the capping it's to cover up the fact that they were using tactical nukes underground the next month they stopped the capping you didn't see they that anymore it went away all right so all of a sudden they stopped doing it once i call them out on it i blew their story i blew their cover story all right. And here was the kicker. Who do you think did it? Who do I think personally? Yeah. Well, I would have to say our government is responsible for that. Which part of the government? White hat or black hat? Probably the white hats. Yeah. Cool for you, dude. I have been using this question on various radio hosts. You're the first one to get it right. Really? <laughs> Everybody said black cats, and and I just said, well, if it's black cats, tell me something. The capping started in the last three months of Trump's administration. Oh well, there's a that's a good giveaway right there. Yeah, you know. So oh, you're smarter than the average bear. <laughs> well, I've been uh, you know been reading up on things, and uh, Marshall, I do want to I do want to thank you and JP, by the way, for following along all the fireball reports that have been going on for a long time now, and it's all over the news, by the way. This is something that you could look up right now in real time and see all the all the articles about fireballs. It, it, it just goes on and on. It is, and um, I the reporting is I the people are reporting and. God, I remember for so many years, uh, the only, the, the best video, the, the best observation videos were always uh, airline passengers because they're above the chemtrail layer and they could really get a nice viewing sky. And, but these people would just go to great lengths, you know, to make sure they just wanted to put it up, but they didn't want anybody to know who they are. You know, and they would just throw them up and they wouldn't answer and try and contact them. TikTok, you know, first off, you, you, your TikTok ID is right there. And uh, but what I love about TikTok is that the people are taking video and they're they're trying to they say, well, look at this. I'm looking at that and then I'm going to do this. And they're asking questions and they're trying to solve problems and they're trying to figure out what they're seeing. And maybe if it's a problem of their phone and that to me, that's authentic, baby. Would you that's say as authentic uh, as it gets? Uh, Marshall, let know? me just, uh, let me just ask you this uh, question really quickly. Do you think that TikTok is the best thing that came from the CCP? Well, I kind of look at it this way. They're blood-sucking <laughs> communists. Allow us to have more free speech than our own blood-sucking communists. Go figure. It's an interesting American uh, communists turn are more hard-ass than Chinese. <laughs> That's got to say something. Oof. Carry on, Marshall. <laughs> but, uh, you know, definitely I think TikTok is, is people are there. They're talking. They're putting it up, and they're not getting suppressed. Yeah, that's one yeah. good thing, though. I mean, those people on there, I mean, a lot of people could say whatever they want about TikTok, but it does serve a good purpose at times. It does. Just like the and, internet. You know, I remember for many years on YouTube, before YouTube started this 
uh, you know, the suppression crap. Before they were infiltrated, yes. Yeah, but, you know, before they betrayed the country, turned into, uh, Google's the most dangerous company in the world now. And, uh, I mean, they have the ability to sway elections. They can reprogram your mind, disappear people from history. Ah, that's a lot of evil for my likings. And, um, but what I saw happening, and this was starting up, gosh, uh, uh, I would say it started happening towards the end of the Obama administration. What I noticed was that when people put up a video, especially a good one, like at altitude or something like that from a passenger jet, they would put it up and they'd get 10, 15,000 views the first day. Boom. And then it was like the minute the AI could tell that you were doing an observation video, boom, it ratchets down. Videos that were getting 15,000 views get 150 views. It sounds about right. Yeah, they, they do that to me all the time. Yeah, yeah. And so they started suppressing it. And I think, uh, you know, their reputation precedes them. So people are going over to TikTok. Also, you see some on Facebook and Instagram, uh, not as much. The, but the ones that have the, the research quality that we like, uh, people asking questions, getting personal, expressing their feelings, that's right. on TikTok. And I just, uh, I just love watching them. I love the questions that the people throw out there. Very nice. Yes, it's a great place. Uh, if you're looking for certain things, you can definitely find them aside from, uh, you know, women dancing and showing animals. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like instead of calling it TikTok, they should have called it shake your booty pretty much well, i mean that's what it's uh, primarily used for yeah yeah i i get i get tired no, but you, you know, know people are just these young girls you know, that are look at me they're a little misguided that's all i claim to fame i have breasts you know <laughs> yeah I, I mean well they've been infiltrated yeah they do they do but uh, i mean it's it's clutter no, Still the same though in the middle, and you know, in all the clutter, there's some gems. There's some gems, right? And that's that's what I like about TikTok. You can dig in, find the gems. It has the international coverage that's really good. Um, I like it. Other platforms, you know, you don't find. I don't. You know, I tried finding two sun observation videos on Truth Social. Yeah, it's <laughs> not gonna be there. No, no, <laughs> no, no. You know, no. Certain certain social sites, I mean, they're they're political or whatever, or they have different audiences. But yeah, we go with what's giving us, and we're going to have a lot coming up. Um, I want to talk about this article I did, Revelation eight seven of right. Planet X. Now you both made some interesting discoveries, as you say, keys vital to scientifically decoding Revelation scriptures. Let's start there. Yep, and what happened was. I just put up a new site for the Colburn Bible at colburn.com, K-O-L-B-R-I-N.com. And there's a link there on, on my Yaza page, and it'll take it to you. And when I was looking at my Colburn site, I had a lot of my, you know, descriptive text metadata that was from when I originally published the work back in 2005 and 2006. And it was, it's been working fine for years, explained it, but I just felt it was time, you know, based on all the research we've been doing to come at it fresh, just rewrite it and start with something different because the Colburn Bible has sold internationally and there's just oodles and oodles of copies. Um, the gosh, I mean, <laughs> I don't, you know, it's like, I don't know. I never counted it up. It's in the tens, twenties of thousands, thirties of thousands, something like that. Uh, cause I have multiple editions, multiple distribution channels and, uh, you know, this is going on about 18 years. So when I did this and I'm reading passages of the Colburn and what I did with this site was that I really did pull in. Uh, I was researching the Celtic texts, which is the Cole book. And that te those texts were written about the same time as the New Testament. And 
in the Celtic texts are actual extra biblical eyewitness accounts by Celtic merchants of Jesus, his disciples, and his family while they were conducting business in Israel. People don't, at that time, uh, Saudi Arabia was, you know, kind of like the, uh, excuse me, Great Britain was like the Saudi Arabia of tin and tin. This was the end of the Bronze Age, and we still use brawn. It's it's a wonderful metal. We use it for all kinds of things, church bells, plumbing, things like that. But uh, it's very difficult to find the tin, and it was in Great Britain, and it was why the Phoenicians wound up getting as far north to Great Britain. They were the best mariners in the day. The Phoenicians literally were the SpaceX of their time, and uh, just cutting edge technology, cutting edge sailing techniques. They could navigate by the stars. They were really, really amazing. Their trade routes were all through the Mediterranean and along the shores of Africa and uh, Eastern Africa and to the south and to the north, Great Britain for tin. And so when I was pulling all of this together, I was just, you know, had to go read here, read there. And then something took me to Revelation. And I I don't read Revelation that much. I'm not Christian. So I don't have an eschatological dog in the fight. All right. I'm just reading it for what it is. Wisdom text. That's it. I just read the words. And uh, meaning, let someone else put the meaning into it. I want to know if the words line up with the science. And uh, what I found is 8-7 is scientifically precise. I'm not talking about square pegs and round holes, you know, shave a little off the corner, form it or bend it. I'm talking about it's like it fits just like the key in your door lock on your door. Boom. That perfect. And uh, when we unlocked that on 8-7 as a process of doing the text for the Colburn site, I put the, my work on the Colburn website on pause, and I wrote this article, Revelation 8-7, because it's just like all of this just hits me, and I'm seeing this amazing blood metaphor connection. And the blood metaphor, which appears in Exodus, and it appears in uh, Revelation, and it appears in the Egyptian text, the Colburn Bible, is all three, the metaphor is used to describe the exact same natural phenomena. It's not talking about blood in a social context, such as, you know, generations upon generations, father of so and so and whatever, or, you know, he, he, you know, he was cleaved and spilled his blood on the ground or whatever. Uh, no, it, it's always describing a natural phenomena that's a result of something coming from the sky. And that metaphor was used consistently. When we found that, it locked it in. And what the metaphor is really talking about is the iron oxide. And when you get into the article, it's a lengthy article. It's very, very popular. People really love it. And I will take and walk you through this literally step by step by step, breaking down Revelation 8-7. And what I would say to those of you who are interested uh, about the Colburn Bible and Revelation, uh, just here's a couple of things I'll throw at you. They have origin concurrence. Uh, these, the Holy Bible and, and when I'm talking about the Holy Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Old Testament and the New Testament, were, which is the book is the Holy Bible is in two parts. So is the Colburn Bible, Egyptian and the Celtic texts. And the Egyptians and the Hebrews were writing at the same time as uh, the, you know, the New Testament was being penned. And Celtic priests in Great Britain were writing the Cole book, which became the Celtic texts. Uh, but what I think is really exciting about this, what I found, is that uh, in the Colburn Bible, I mean, they talk about the destroyer. That's what they call right. Planet X. And in the Colburn Bible, in the Book of Gleanings, which is the flood 
story. Uh, you know, Noah's flood in for the Holy Bible, for the Colburn Bible, it's Susuta and Hanok. Again, the blood metaphor is used there as well. So we have all of these correlations that come up. And what's fascinating for me is I'm a publisher. I have to do provenance. And if you go to my site, colburn.com, uh, especially if you want to read the about page, it's down at the bottom. I leave it there for the people that are really looking for stuff and digging around. Most people are kind of casual. Well, yeah, but, it's it's very you know, new to them still. That's the. That's but okay. I, I wanted to make this site, you know, for the people that already have it and love it and want to talk about it. I wanted to give them something where yeah. I knew they would find it, and it's on the about page. And I go through there on the process of how we vetted it. Uh, which would took us three years to vet the work. But Damn. what's important to understand about, and I'm talking about really uh, in the Old Testament, we're talking about the five books of Moses, all right? And everything, the, 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 both accounts, the Hebrew account and the Egyptian account, both of those were written by people who lived through that event. Both the Egyptian texts and the five books of Moses were inscribed by people who were survivors of Exodus. And Exodus was the last Planet X flyby. The one, there's others recorded previous to that several others that are mentioned in the Colburn, but this is the one of interest. So these are, what we have are eyewitness accounts. So first person accounts, in other words. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And uh, so there is, um, all of this comes together. The Colburn Bible is, it's called a Bible because it's an authority, authoritative text. The difference between the Holy Bible and the Colburn Bible, the Holy Bible is inspired of God, whereas the Colburn Bible is inspired of man. It was trying to figure out why the Egyptians were trying to figure out why they lost, how this uh, the this God of the slaves, you know, and we're talking about the, you know, the pillar, and how was it that this Hebrew God was so powerful that it could do what Egypt's entire pantheon of gods could not do. And the Egyptians wanted to find out who the Hebrews were praying to, because their idea was that the Hebrews were praying to a lesser God, and they wanted to know the greater God of the Hebrew lesser God, if that's making sense. And what the Egyptians did is they went everywhere throughout their trading realm. And part of that was with the Phoenicians, the, which were based uh, in what we modern day Lebanon, northern Israel. And uh, Byblos, uh, Bible comes from Byblos, which was a seaport. And uh, the uh, and today, when we use the Phoenician term, uh, Bible, when we use the Bible, it is an authoritative text. So it could be a fisherman's Bible, a knitting Bible, you know, a cooking Bible. There's all kinds of Bibles. But a big difference was that in the Holy Bible, Moses had to write a narrative that would survive thousands of years so that it would arrive to be understandable to us in our time. We are the intended recipients of that story and our generations being those of us alive today. Uh, whereas the Egyptians weren't interested in lasting thousands of years. They just wanted to know why they got whipped up. <laughs> right. All right. And they collected up. And one of, interestingly enough, one of our researchers, Glenn, Glenn uh, Kimball, 
was able to determine that there are 11 books in the Colburn Bible, and one of them, I believe it's the fourth book, called Sons of Fire. I was about to ask you that, by the way. Was, I was going to say, how many books were there? And I, I think there was 11. The first, 11 the books? The first were written in Egypt, right? Right. And uh, so the Egyptian texts are clearly in the first two creation and gleanings, and then also manuscripts. However, the fourth one, we believe, are uh, what remains of Phoenician family law and folklore. Uh, yeah, that so would make sense. They had, uh, and uh, when you read their family law, all their cords, you know, you mm -hmm. don't do this and you don't do that and you don't do this, you know, and the, the Phoenicians were great mariners, you know, and you're looking at all these rules and it kind of makes you think, boy, is this like a Phoenician has a girl in every port? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, it is quite something else. It pulls all the history, pulls it all together. Uh, tremendous amount of mystery. But uh, and an important part of the Phoenicians is that a lot of people don't realize it is uh, our language. Western alphabets are uh, based on the 22 letter alphabet. Of the Phoenicians, the Phoenician script. And uh, so English and every, uh, you know, your romantic languages, alphabets are all something that stemmed out of the Phoenician The Phoenicians, language. right. So even though they passed into history, uh, we're still gifted with their language system. But for those that get into Revelation 8, Revelation 8, 7 and Planet X, the blood, which I have on the site, when you get into that, it's very detailed, and I walk you step by step through it so that you see the connections and how perfect they are. And Marshall, you know, I have a, just a random question to ask you in, in regards to all, all the things that we're talking about. And there's another prominent figure, in my opinion, who I've seen speak a number of times in person, and that's Graham Hancock. Um, I, I never really asked you what your opinions were on Graham Hancock and some of the information that he's been doing for the last 20 years. And of course, the more recent Netflix documentary that he put out caused a lot of, it caused a lot of commotion, but these were things that he's been talking about for the last, uh, his entire uh, career, basically. Um, oh. Your thoughts and opinions on just some of the things he talks about and the sort of almost like Planet X sort of flood story sort of thing he has uh, going as well. I think his work is superb. I don't follow him that closely. I've watched video presentations that he's done. Uh, but um, I have a couple of Graham's books. Uh, he's, to me, he's an honest seeker of truth. And I see, a, you know, I see the honest seekers out there. And then I see the guys that are, you know, they're just players. Right, right. You know, they're, they're pumping the, pumping the audience. But here's, here's a kind of a thing that to me has always been the measure is the integrity of your work. And that's what keeps you out there. And I think Graham and I, and I, I feel that if Graham and I were to have a talk about, it, we'd agree on this point. When we talk about integrity, is what does integrity mean? Integrity means it's not about being right; it's about getting it right. And we don't want to be the news; we want to report the news. But the most important thing about the integrity is we keep the faith with our audience that we're not trying to steer them into an agenda. But we're giving them, a, you know, here's what we're finding. Here's our path of discovery. Here's what we're learning, and we're sharing it with them. So we're more, you know, pioneering type of stuff where it's almost like keeping a journal as you're discovering, mm. you know, going yeah. up a new river in the Nile or something like that, tributary. And uh, you're making, you're, you're sharing that with people. And it was for me in 1980, uh, in 2021, I wrote an article on Yowza about human trafficking. And boy, that set the deep state on fire against me. And <laughs> yeah. man, they crushed me. They made me disappear. I mean, literally, you can go on the YouTube uh, search engine, type in Marshall Masters Planet X, 
see what you get. What inspired Keep you, in however? Mind that uh, my channel, my yeah. Galbooks channel is like 19 million views today. Sure, sure. And uh, so what they do is they just hard ban you. Uh, in Google just hard banned me. And right. if I'd only been out for a few years and whatever, and that would have been it. I would have been over. That would have been the end of my, you know, I see. Planet X, my publishing, all of that. Welcome to the exciting world of fast food, right? Sure, sure. But Marsha, what, and, what, what exactly? And I didn't. I survived mm -hmm. because my work had integrity and my audience, uh, millions of people know me and they keep coming back to see what I'm doing. Right, and right. so I have survived search engine cancellation. And for one reason, I keep the faith with my audience. It's about integrity. And he does the same thing, and so do you. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, I keep a 10 toes down here, Marshall. And I have to ask you though, what exactly was the catalyst for you to begin talking about, you know, other things aside from what you usually talk about, Planet X, strange well, observations. What exactly was it for you that inspired you, Marshall, to you know talk about human trafficking uh, to any regard? Well, the human trafficking, uh, this was something pretty recent. In terms of what actually got me started was I was the guy who found the Nostradamus King of Terror comet that was prophesized to appear in 1999. And... In 1999, on the internet, I had 5 million hits. In 1999. Jesus. Okay? That's a lot. And uh, what happened was there was a live NASA stream feed, and it was in QuickTime. That's a nice format. I like that. Ah, QuickTime. And uh, the what happened was uh, I was a science feature producer in the 80s with CNN, worked with a lot of crew, always had a crew, was always directing cameramen, we call them shooters. And in a professional camera, you have what's called an overscan area. And it'll, they'll have a little white line box in there. And then so the, the shooter knows that's what people are going to see on their television at home. What's outside that in the overscan area is real helpful so that you don't have a situation where somebody's elbow squeaks into the scene, something <laughs> like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you make sure that you don't have any uh, unusual artifacts popping mm. up. And what will happen is the shooters have a tendency when they see something odd in particular, they go at it like bird dogs. I mean, just boom. They'll go right at to it, zoom in on it, and they want to see what it is. And so this NASA cinema, uh, shooter saw something in the overscan, zoomed up into it and looked at it, studied it, and then pulled back to his original setting, determining that it wasn't going to interfere with his shot. Well, when he did that, he, he captured three objects. And all three objects, I identified all three objects, two of which um, there was uh, uh, another guy. He was the one that did the, the, the face on Mars. And he came out and said, I was confused by flashbulbs, which was really stupid. And uh, But it was a disinfo punch. And I had... Oh, you mean Richard Hoagland? Hoagland, yeah. Oh Hoagland my. attacked me and said I was confused by flashbulbs. And I'm thinking, Richard, you know, it's been a long time since we used flashbulbs. I remember when I was a kid. <laughs> wow. You know, we don't use them anymore. Haven't since the 70s. And um, the... He was probably wearing a cowboy hat when he told you that, Marshall. Yeah. But, you know, here was the kicker. You know, this is cool things that happened to me because a lot of, you know, people are following my stuff. Right. A cosmonaut on the Russian Mir station, which was operational at the time, corroborated two of the three objects, which were the alleged flashbulb reflections. One was a communication satellite in low Earth orbit, and the second was a spent booster off of a Russian missile. But the third object was clearly a comet because it had the classic horseshoe ring of a comet. And so 
This was captured during the eclipse that Nostradamus predicted would happen in 1999, and it was captured from over Turkey. So that's where I got my start in all this. I was the guy who found the Nostradamus comet. And ever since then, you know, it's it's just got crazy stayed that way. <laughs> that happens. Yeah. That's part of life. Yeah, it's part of life. But know? in terms, hey, but Marshall, but in terms of, uh, what are you going to do? Right, exactly. I hear you. I hear you. But in terms of the, the, the child trafficking, though, what exactly was it that made you want to get into all that? It was, you know, something what I actually said that caused all the grief for me was just a few words. But uh, what happened was I have from time to time, I get somebody that will send me a link and they'll say, you know, get to it fast, like before it's sponged. And I got one of those. It was a video on BitChute and went to it and it was something pulled off the, the dark web. And this is that part of the internet that the pedophiles and the monsters and the elites, all the nasty people, that's their version of the internet. And brought to you by the feds, by the way. Yeah. They're the ones who created yeah. it. And so uh, I saw a video of a, uh, uh, a, body, uh, uh, a body rendering plant. And it started with a flatbed uh, truck with wood slats backing up and they were offloading the bodies of uh young men in about their 20s and they were just tossing them out of the truck like cordwood they were stiff already and uh then they were taking them into this facility and the facility had an just a real long hallway with gurneys on both sides and what they were doing was opening up their body cavities and taking out their major organs, heart, you know, I mean, in the, I mean, uh, liver, stuff like that. And the, and they would take the, when they were doing this, they would pull out the intestines and just drape them over the side of the gurney down to the floor. So you saw this little waterfall of human intestines and gurneys down this long hallway. And then it went to what the purpose of the video was. Uh, they were it was, it was whoever was doing the video was obviously had authority or they were under the direction of someone with authority because everybody in, that was working in this facility uh, that were b harvesting body parts out of these men all backed away and they were, you could see the look in their eyes. They didn't, you know, didn't want to interfere at all. This was, you know, somebody powerful. And then this person was focusing on a young toddler, young girl. Um, she was, you know how when they start walking, they have that stilted walk back and forth. Yeah, they stammer around. Yeah. And uh, you could, I could tell looking at this child that she was loved. She was loved, you know, her dress, her hair was just, it was a mother who was just wanting it to be perfect. And she was, they started, the, the person shooting her was following her as she was walking into this facility looking for her parents. And you could hear her calling out, mama, dada, mama, dada. And they're following her. And I'm watching this beautiful little toddler walking past this cascading waterfall of human intestines on both sides. And she's going, mama, dada, mama, dada, mama, dada. She was desperate. You could hear the horror in her voice. And you knew that she, that was, she died that day because that's what they have to do. They have to pump you up into a high state of fear and horror before they uh, will harvest your adrenochrome. So obviously what they were doing was experimenting with a new way to do that. And this was a video report. And so I didn't, I mentioned it in a little bit without going into any details, but what I said on my site that made Google go to war on me. And I mean, they went to, when they go to war on you, you don't know what the hell war is until Google gets a case of the ass on you. Uh, but what I wrote that got them at me and Facebook as well, Facebook and Google, YouTube, the three of them ganged up on me, 
was this. God's, I'm talking about the people that were doing this to this child. Right. I said, God's judgment upon them will be heard in the voices of children. And that was it. They wrecked my life for saying that. Just for saying that. God's judgment upon them will be heard in the voices of children. And, uh, and that is exactly what's happening right now. Look at the sound of freedom. Okay. And this was, you know, I wound up in, in 2021. So uh, it took me a long time to rebuild. They destroyed me. Uh, just a visceral.